Uh, we have about a half hour to accomplish what Paul has asked us to accomplish. So, my name is Gary Holloway. I live in the Town Hill neighborhood. Um, it's great to be your facilitator of this uh, particular session. Um, I didn't know I was facilitating this session in this particular session until about three minutes ago. Um, <laughs> I knew I was facilitating, but Paul's trick is he doesn't let me know which one. So a regional commission should be convened to develop a plan for flood prevention. We read that before. Does anyone have any questions about if we're in the right we're in the right room? Okay. So Oh my god, this is fun. All right, ready? Hi! Uh, we'll be alright just a minute. They're just passing. Um, so we have about 10 minutes here um, to talk about what, so let me, let me back up. The goal of this is to develop um, a couple, two, three action oh, okay. steps right. that we can actually um, recommend to the commission that's going to be formed, which we'll need a bunch of volunteers to get behind. And I'm going to pass around, maybe I'll, I'll do that now, and I'll start passing around a sheet. And this sheet's meant for you to get more information. Okay, and hopefully get behind as the commission forms and these ideas start to kind of uh, come to fruition. So rather than wait to the end, I'm gonna go ahead and just pass this around and please sign up. Um, this is so you can stay in the loop with what's happening. Um, we're gonna spend 10 minutes talking about what steps are necessary um, to take um, right now to kind of get this moving. Um, so let's, let's, I want to give everyone a voice here, um, so let's be relatively short so we can make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think the first step would be to find out what persons or bodies or organizations already exist which have knowledge and or authority over riparian management. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have we have a I should mention we have a scribe here who's taking notes um, so that we don't lose any of these thoughts. Um, yes, ma'am. I, I, I guess I'm Cindy. I guess I feel there's a step even before that, which is who is going to do this work actually. Um, you know, commissions are often where ideas go to die, and that cannot happen in this commission. Can I ask Can I ask a question to the group? It was mentioned in the larger group that there was an existing structure already around such a thing. Uh, All right. Someone speak to that just so we can record maybe who might be doing this, some of this work already. Sure, I can speak a little to it. Christian Meyer, Executive Director of the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Uh, we're 23 towns here in Central Vermont and a little few, few towns up in, um, in Orange County. It covers much of the Winooski Water Basin. Michelle Braun is your point to next to me, uh, Director of um, Friends of the Winooski. Um, so we do have a structure where governments are meeting regularly monthly to come together and talk about these intermunicipal issues and how to confront them. Uh, we were really conceived around supporting municipalities and looking at land use policies and extend to transportation and clean water to a degree uh, and energy and climate change and adaptation. Um, we're often kind of a, a Swiss army knife. Whatever tool you need, you can pull it out and, and uh, can I just ask, are you a body that could identify the appropriate experts and, and marshal them? Like, are, am I looking at the people who would be leading this effort, or does it need to be something on top or different from, from uh, your body? I can't speak to that directly. I mean, it could be, it could be our body, but I don't want to um, assume that one, that addresses the needs of, of the residents of Montpelier or two, that, um, that we're necessarily best suited for. There are other organizations, I mentioned Friends of the Unity, there's the Natural Resources Defense Council. There's also state agencies like VEM who may want to be addressing the Memorial uh, watershed, as well as the Unity, as well as the Black River, et cetera. So it might be part of a bigger thing. We can definitely host the group like that. We do do that conditionally, but I think it's uh, for the community to come together and make that decision if we're the best place for it. To dispel the so acronyms on you get lost a little bit. So Vermont Emergency Management is the yes, name. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, so just making sure we got we captured that. Um, others, Michelle. I, I would just say, you know, this. Um, I've worked with the river for twenty five years, and I know only about a tenth of the people in this room. And I think it's fantastic that so many people are interested in the river 
And so that would be a reason I would say not to just hand it off to Christian or me or us to work on this because because I think it's important that um, as many people who want to be involved are able to but maybe it's, maybe it's important to recognize the groups who may have a role in this as professionals mm -hmm. to make sure they have a seat at the table mm -hmm. and right. participate mm -hmm. with the you know with the, with the community mm -hmm. on that. Like, make sure we don't miss anybody who's already doing some of this work, right? But that'll be important. I'll just throw another name out there. I work as an administrative assistant for the Vermont River Conservancy, yes. so mm -hmm. we're already doing a lot of this work. Um, so I think it's important. Other initial first steps. Um, I think quantifying the challenge from flooding, rain event flooding, and from ice jam flooding. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we can get the data from this last flood from all the gauges on um, the Winooski and the North Branch and the confluence, um, and then get climatologists and hydrologists, whomever, to come up with the worst case scenario. You know, what when when the next storm or another big storm is 20, and the air is 20 degrees warmer. Mm. So we're gonna have exponentially more rainfall. You know, what's that? Is it is it too much to even contemplate addressing? Or is it within our means to come up with a plan to, to know what that, the greatest probable rain event will be, and the flows coming in through the Winooski and the North Branch, and then exiting through, from the confluence downstream, can we can we determine whether or not we can increase the capacity, the flow capacity of the Winooski from the confluence downstream to accommodate that worst case scenario where we don't flood again? But we don't know that yet. So let's figure that out. So another thing, and this kind of goes with what you were saying at, at, at first, is also getting in touch with those other municipalities that already yes. have these uh, have these uh, permissions or organizations happening, and it's not just upstream; it is downstream, mm -hmm. right? Like Richmond's got to be on board as much as Cabot is on board, and so really taking a holistic look at the watershed. And one other question for uh, you, I hear that you're, you're meeting frequently about these issues. Are these uh, open to the public or are these uh, like smaller departmental meetings? Or, um, what are the avenues for people to get more involved in? Maybe that's for after this round too. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, punt on that one. I think that it's a longer conversation and I don't even know all the organizations that are already having these conversations. I know we are engaged in emergency management. There's a regional emergency management committee, but that's not just doing water, it's not just doing the river. So it, it's complicated, but we'd be sitting at the table along with a lot of other folks, kind of looking at what's already there, creating something new, but not so. Other thoughts around the initial first steps or actions um, to help um, you know, kind of fuel some of the early stages of this work? I think there's there's things that we know through Friends of Winooski and the, nature, uh, the River Conservancy and from our rivers program that we have, the Department of Environmental Conservation, things that we could do today. We know about rain gardens. We know about, about uh, impervious surfaces. So I think it's kind of like that one option that was about developing a tool. We could develop a quick list as we're doing these other things. But here are things that towns or just homeowners could do with their own yards that's going to help slow the water down. Not necessarily in the river, maybe, but just help so it doesn't get to the storm drain, so it doesn't get to the river so quickly. I think that would be a good first step to do. Nick, do you know that program? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I would say, yeah, the idea of let's start a new commission, right? Like really going to the Regional Planning Commission, Friends of Lewski existing groups and maybe soliciting their feedback on what is, you know, they've been advocating, a lot of people have been advocating for strategies to keep water in the contour and let's slow it down. As a side note, I don't know what's going on where this dog river, what the hell is that? We're going to talk about, oh, let's do grandiose ideas. And then there's this 200 yard stone embankment put up. Mm -hmm. So three days ago is when I saw it. I mean, it's insane. So what is all this for? 
So there is existing systems in place. I mean, how do we support or you know, do we form a new commission? Another one of perhaps a redundancy? I want to also put out there, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about um, like existing nonprofit or government entities, but like, what about the what about the private sector that has like it was mentioned several times in the first meeting that there's a lot of professionals in our community in Vermont who are already doing this work. Um, Jimmy, you had spoken a little bit to this, you know, in terms of because people were studying this stuff at Middlebury College at UVM and Dartmouth, and, and we have people in our community who are engineers and architects. And, you know, can we tap into some of that? And I don't oh, thank you, Gary. A wonderful segue to what I was going to say anyway. Um, in terms of the experts, I think that there's, there's the convening experts in bodies, and then there are the, the experts who have been studying. The ones I'm familiar with are we're all based around something called the Vermont EPSCORE program. It housed it based out of the University of Vermont, but it included St. Michael's, Middlebury, Dartmouth, etc. The point being, the, the folks who have, for a decade, I think at least, been studying what's happened, what's going to happen in terms of climate change, watershed. And I, where I was going to raise my hand for this anyway was to say at the outset of any work like this, I think bringing those folks in to help prioritize where, where you know, if there's a lot to be done, where, where is the biggest bang for the buck and focus going forward? Now, I, I know some of the groups in the Vermont Rivers, Conservancy, and others may already have some of that in your hands. So I don't want to discount. Expertise already in the hand that's in the folks in the room, but to the extent it's beyond what they already have, we have those experts. I, mean, I think they they should be probably would help guide the priorities. Can you say again the name of that group? It's it's Vermont EPSCO. I can I can get it. It's 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 a, it's a wonderful acronym. E T it's a national science foundation. Yeah, it's a it's a national science foundation to stimulate research in various states around the country. But the point is that the Vermont one of the focuses okay, of the Vermont Score program in recent years was resiliency in the chest in chest, excuse me. You still live in DC. Um in the Champlain Basin. So and I interviewed them, many of them, for things I was doing, and they talked all about river, you know, floodplains and rainfall protection. Um, we have a few more minutes here, um, here and then here. Um, when we're talking about higher education, this, remember, Norwich University, yeah. and they have a specific program, civic engagement. It's a huge part of that university, is giving back to the community. We have engineering programs and all that the university is all about on the ground learning. This, this kind of works perfect for them. So Jason, I have to pick on you. We have the principal of high school here. And so like is there a way that we can engage so we've brought up this is important to be engaging the youth, engaging the younger population? Like is there a way that we can capture that in some of this work? Absolutely. Um, we have a strong community-based learning program. Um, in Katie, you're meeting with Matt McLean on Wednesday. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so we've already started to lay the groundwork of that conversation of how we can attract our students um, this work. It's either the commission next door, getting some new voice on that commission. <coughs> we know they'll be the next generation that we're carrying on. Vermont River Conservancy was doing a Face the River class here at the high school in North Branch Nature Center as well. Mm. And these students put forward incredible ideas mm. for for how we could redesign the town to be friendlier to our members. Mm. So they're already engaging with these questions. I'd love to, I'm from North Branch, this is Emily Seifer. I'd love to show of hands, how many people have seen the films that these students put together and that were shown in the Pavilion building last winter? So the, you all should, you'll be so inspired. You can go to North Branch Nature Center's website, go to presentations, you'll find it. Uh, spend, get some popcorn and spend a couple of evenings. Yeah. Oh, just going back, excuse me, to the whole watershed analysis as well making sure it's we have so many different sources of information, the university sources, um, the one that you mentioned. And, um, so taking a coordinated look, one of the things that we, I think we do need to take a look at is our soils and our forests, because our soils are very, very wet right now, and we really need to take a look at, will they get too wet? And will we lose them that way, for example? 
So there's a lot of upstream work to do, which will involve other, other communities as well. Um, and there's so many resources here. So what, what we're, we're about to get, um, and I'll have time for maybe one more. I just want to point out that, you know, just having been through a lot of these different processes, um, having people sign up, you know, as the time goes forward, you've got less and less people involved. Mm -hmm. And so, like, my question to you all is, like, you know, or maybe as an action item, how do we keep people, how do we keep the community engaged? This flooding event will go, you know, hopefully to stay in the distance for a while, right, uh, before the next flooding event. But, you know, five years, 10 years from now, like, we may have forgotten what happened during our meeting, or we may have forgotten. So I just want to kind of emphasize the point of, like, try to keep it, keep the community engaged in this conversation. And then, you know, there's burnout with volunteers and, and these different commissions and stuff. So just thinking about how we can kind of continually bring in the reinforcements um, as people are going to step off naturally for other reasons. Um, is there any other thoughts on uh, on action items uh, just to kind of kickstart? Maybe we'll take one or two more thoughts and then we'll, we'll transition. Uh, yeah, I'm Patrick, I live in Middlesex, and just a late person on all this, so I appreciate you hearing from all the experts, but um, I wanted to sort of follow a bunch of ideas, but I think in particular, Collins, about sizing the scale of the problem. Um, I know how important rain gardens are and uh, rain barrels and all small scale things like that, but with the magnitude of the issues I expect to be upcoming, I'm afraid they'll just be a drop in the bucket. And so getting the that EBSCOR group or whatever it was called, and really like commissioning them to like design a plan um, that can that can be responded to so we really know what that worst case is. Mm -hmm. uh, seems get the get the ecological engineers involved um, so we can really size it seems seems important and seems like a defined action item mm -hmm. that then the commission can respond to. Hi, I'm Diana. I live in Montpelier. I, I, it seems like what, what would be really useful would be some kind of um, picture of the whole watershed and somebody being able to say the greatest potential for controlling water is here, here, and yes, here. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Sounds like a great project for that might exist. Yes. <laughs> that might exist by AR. Yeah. 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 You know, there's some three D um, you know um, uh, Equipment. <laughs> yeah, we've all already an initiative. It's a floodplain Who's doing that? Functioning floodplain initiative. It's a multi big conglomeration of people working together. Uh, UDM, folks, private consultants, nonprofits, everybody. Okay. I think they're tied in with that group. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> Why would you have to tell us one last I also think that the, I'm Zach with the city of uh, the city also needs to be at the table in this conversation to inform people what we are currently doing, the conversation that we're having with the EDM, where the A&R, where the River Wade is in, about how to even manage the debris that's in there now. Should we be removing some of this debris? How do we do our catch basins? What does that look like? How much volume have we lost in capacity from this current event where we sit today? So can I elaborate off of that? Uh, is that <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Zach, um, you know, one of the things that we learned during this uh, disaster is commu how important communication is. Mm -hmm. And so like for the city to be in, to know what's happening with these conversations or the various entities, uh, you know, and all of us who are trying to volunteer, so setting up, so having some kind of a structure of communication that can be accessible um, so that everyone knows what's, what's happening and they're not reinventing the wheel of doing something on the side that's already happening. Yeah. So something that some people may not be aware is from 2011, we have a list of hotspot areas that get checked before every single storm, and that actually helped prevent further flooding oh. that may have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, but we had staff at the front line breaking out the inlet to make sure that it didn't over top and flood that. Fantastic. So I said last one, but I'll give one message. No, no, no. I didn't transition to resources, but um, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can sneak it into as resources if you like. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna spend uh, we have about yeah. ten minutes. Ten minutes to finish up. Uh, so we're gonna spend seven minutes and we're gonna recap the last three. So seven minutes. Let's talk about what resources we need to to, to enable this group. 
uh, do we need funding? Do we need, uh, what do we need? What are the resources that, that it's going to take for this group to really get, get going? We need someone to collect the resources, the intellectual resources that already exist. We need a list maker, um, and it should probably be someone who's pretty integrated into the river or natural resources community already, a group or a person. So they can make comprehensive lists of what talent we already have and what they're doing. Great. Other thoughts? What are the resources we might need? Just, just to piggyback on that. So I, I did this for a project in North in Northfield where we create the spreadsheet. You have the entity, what their assets are, their intellectual assets, their equipment assets, whatever it may be, contact information. You know, so you have the you know what each person can bring to the table for you. Contact information and what their you know, what their skill is or what they can bring. Right. Yeah. Any resources that we might need? I just, knowing like how often people are in meetings trying to connect to information with one another, I wonder if there are other ways that we could be using technology to share information with one another. Um, I think meetings are great and connecting with others is great. And I know none of us need to sit in another meeting just to collect information from another partner organization or whatever. Um, so if we can think creatively about how we share information uh, across these different brilliant entities. Right, and just, just for this, these three meetings alone, right, uh, people have been able to participate virtually because they are a single parent at home, or um, if they weren't able to actually even participate virtually, they could go onto the board and they can kind of communicate, you know, so those kind of technologies, and, you know, and every, you know and it's accessibility too, right, for people who might not be able to participate in these types of discussions uh, in person. Well, I was going to say, in addition to studying this commission, uh, being responsible to, for, for, for studying and laying out what the action items might be in conjunction with the experts, might be the uh, purpose of this commission to also be doing the outreach and gathering volunteers to actually complete the work. Mm -hmm. um, getting getting those people who are going to go out and plant trees on river banks, who are who are, who are going to you know help help get involved and actually get their hands dirty, much like the uh, disaster preparedness brigade uh, idea that we talked about. So, like Paul said, you know, an idea that maybe didn't make it into a group can actually get incorporated into. Um, all of the groups, like that volunteer they really should be integrated into all of these ideas, right? So great example. I um, like the concept of the CCCs, you know, yes. the CCCs where our roads literally got built. Yeah. Pretty much everything we use today got built. Thirties. We can't force it our CCC, but we can create a Montpelier CCC, and I bet a lot of youth we already have we one. one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I, I just think there needs to be administrative assistant type of funding. Possibly you could get a um, volunteer uh, temporary leader to coordinate information gathering, but I wouldn't want someone to be tasked uh, with collecting and organizing all this information without pay. I, I just would be in support of finding funding for such a person. It sounds like we're going to learn more about this, but it does sound like uh, there is going to be a you know paid staff person who's going to be uh, kind of the you know, overarching paid person who's going to work directly with the commission who gets appointed, and, as well as you know various other interest groups. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can do all the administrative work as well. So we have to consider that. Um, so we have just a few a few minutes left. Um, before we get Chase back. So maybe two more minutes on resources and then we'll spend the last few minutes just recapping. Okay. Just on the resources and the finances. I brought it up in that first meeting. And I know there, there I know there's some work bubbling around the state with this, but the the concept of outcomes based financial social impact investing, it's it's a really powerful investment tool that's being used more and more around the country. It's a great success to fund projects that wouldn't get funded typically like mm -hmm. green infrastructure. When, when the standard bond issue kind of thing doesn't allow for that kind of creativity. And I, I think that, the, I'm no expert in this, but I find the sense that, I've, that I've been involved in these things, um, my, it, in searching for funding for planning, I think is probably gonna do better if it's lumped in, in terms of getting money with the implementation set. Yeah. yeah. So, so not keeping those as separate. Right. Uh, done. Yeah. Adventures. And, and I will put it out there that uh, um, disclaimer: I work, I work for the state Department of Housing and Community Development. I know that there's conversations happening within the legislature right now. And there will be a climate resiliency uh, bill. Uh, there will probably multiple climate resiliency bills. So I encourage maybe maybe one idea would be to have some listening folks participating in those conversations. Um, you know, and I know there's some you know some of the nonprofit groups that we identified here may already be in those conversations. Uh, but there may be some other citizens. Who may want to listen in on those conversations to kind of help influence uh, where where some of that goes, which may be related to funding, which likely be related to funding, planning and implementation. Yeah, and I, I don't have the answer here, but that's great. That's not happening like this month, next no. month. So, and I don't think we want to spin our wheels until then. Definitely, definitely. And, it, and if you bring up a really good point, I think. All of these groups are going to have to think about what is actionable like in the short term. Identify what the short term means. Is the short term what can we do in the next few weeks and months? Because there are some things that we can do in the next few weeks and months. Um, and the kind of the longer short term, like what can we do in the months and the years? And what can we do in the kind of longer term, the planning and kind of the five and ten year period? Uh, I think it's all important. And maybe in the short term, we can do things like organize public presentations and some of this. Right. Any other uh, final thoughts in our last couple minutes here? Let me just say one. I think it would be helpful to think both the long and short term and think of other social movements that have succeeded in doing that. And the example that I came to my mind is what we did with child care. The, the child care bill that passed last year in the legislature is, is an amazing bill. It's going to transform child care as we know it. That took like six years mm -hmm. of a lot of organizing throughout the whole state and a lot of money to help the organizing. Um, but they but they did both. They helped the child care centers and they helped child care professionals and then they did the advocacy and they said, we already know how to fix these problems. It's just how do we get the whole society and the landowners, everybody to do the measures that the organizations and the professionals have already told us that we need to do. So we just gotta find the political and societal will to do it. So using that example of what, what's been successful here in Vermont, what's been successful in other states, someone else mentioned that, what in other states and other countries, um, you know, doing that research, are we? Yeah. Okay. Um, last, last thought here. I'm going to cross the word. I, 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 I chant often about ecological design. Because um, right. there's examples of how it can work in agriculture and energy and housing. And I think when you really get down to it, it's like what we, our opportunity has is going back to what you said, you know, like, we could, you know, they've been fighting environmental issues for a long time, and it's this, now we have climate change. Often the answer is within the environment. 
and the social structures too. Like it's about broken relationships. You know, look at our society, the relationships are all broken. So if we can do something, rather than perhaps form a committee, what can we do to restore those relationships? And that could really put us in place. At, at least we're still talking, right? Because we're gonna burn out. We're gonna the crowds are gonna start to dissipate a bit. How can we make that not happen? Can you uh, just elaborate just a little bit? Like, when you say relationships, relationships between... Well, if you if you look at ecological design, it's about interconnectivity, it's the synergies between things. Yeah. And when we design in our culture, we often isolate. So I'm going to put a house here. That's not going to be involved in the water that flows by. And now, 50, 60 years later. So when you really get down to it, the interconnectedness is about our relationships. And how can we... And we have Montpelier Alive that talks about celebration. You know, we have to watch out for burnout, and we got to celebrate. <laughs> So well, true. and one of the things that combats burnout is staying hopeful and seeing that there are other people who want to be in the room with you and solving the problems alongside you. Yes. So just keeping these conversations going, I think, is a really important part of this. Alongside of that asset, what are the existing entities that can do the thing you want to Right. Well, thank you all for putting all these subjects me up. Oh, and existing entities, for example, being visual, I'm saying, okay, so the watershed maps, there'll be plenty of different ones that we can probably get our hands on and begin to look at and become familiar with the overall watershed. So thank you all for all this input. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm supposed to summarize this in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Probably will not capture all these ideas, but believe me, uh, Katie has uh, taken all these notes down, and uh, I'll leave the sign-up sheet wherever those are, um, so you all can be moved in as we um, um, as continue this conversation. I invite folks to thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.